Hello and welcome to this episode of the Listening Detective TV where I have the wonderful Lisa Newport joining me today. So welcome Lisa. Thank you. Lovely to be here. Fabulous. Well, if you have a subject like confidence, there's, you can't not have this lady on the show. You can't have her because it wouldn't be confidence without Lisa. Um, however, you're going to have to wait to the end of the episode to actually find out a bit more about how to dress with confidence. But to get us started, Lisa, the, the word confidence, can you just share with us, what does that actually mean to you? Confidence to me means that you don't really feel affected by other people's opinions in a sentence that's it so particularly around clothes so you basically wearing what you like what makes you feel good and you really don't give a stuff what other people think and it doesn't affect you how you know if people are looking at you and thinking oh, you know, what she comes as you don't get so yeah that's it in um, a so you, you, you confidence is your whether in clothes it might be but you're happy with who you are what's happening and you don't care what other people think yeah so are you someone that's always been like that do you consider yourself to be someone that doesn't worry about what other people think um i've always been a confident person but not necessarily always felt confident in my clothes right so there was a bit of there was there, there was a bit of a period of my life where I felt my self image and my self esteem were really lacking, but gen, my general confidence wasn't. So yeah. I don't know if that makes sense really, but I wasn't confident in how I looked. However, it didn't affect how I sort of went about my day to day life. No, and, and it, yeah, well, it's great because I think for the sake of the viewers, I think people often think that confidence is a permanent state in all areas of your life all of the time. And I think so the fact that you can be really confident in one area, but not feeling so confident about your clothes. Um, and I guess I get, are you aware that there was there a tipping point when not being confident with your clothes ever impacted the other areas? Um, trying to think back. So, so when I say I lost my confidence around how I looked, it was about around my body image, my self image. I gained a lot of weight when um, I was pregnant with my son and I never really lost that weight. And my mental health was taking a dip. And I sort of then genuinely believed for a long time that my mental health, my depression would be absolutely fine. Everything would be fine if only I lost weight. And it, how I felt about myself impacted my the, the way that I saw myself and the way that I felt about myself in terms of how I looked. Mm. However, while a lot of that was going on, I was smashing it, going for interviews, getting promoted, you know, doing all sorts of other stuff that to the outsider would have just thought, oh, she's, you know, really confident smashing it. So it, it was like there were two conflicting yeah, sides yeah. to me. Um, so yeah um so the, my my weight gain after you know while i was pregnant did long term affect my confidence in that way yeah, yeah. Um, but before then i think the 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 other thing that i can think about tipping point if you think talking about tipping points is i've had a lot of surgery i've got um congenital deformity of my hip and had lots and lots of surgery so my my first ever memories were of being in hospital um and one of the surgeries that I had, I was around eight or nine years old. And despite having had previous surgeries, I didn't have a limp. However, when I got to eight, nine, I think I was, I think it was like my, I had spent my ninth birthday in, in, in plaster. And after that, because I was sort of like conscious, it was that kind of edge where you think, oh, I've had something done to my leg. And I started walking with a limp and the doctors kept saying, oh, well, she doesn't need to because the legs are the same length. But I walked with a limp and then ever beyond that made me sort of self-conscious, if you like. So that combined with if I was feeling low yeah. or, you know, in my teenage life or whatever, there were certain some times where I felt a bit sort of lacking in confidence because of my limp. Mm. Um, I, did, I never got picked for, pe you know, the netball or things yeah. because I couldn't run. <laughs> no. Well, and, and what it sounds like, and I, I'm, I'm obviously this is not pure listening here, this is just chatting with you and about sort of paraphrasing. It sounds like when there's there's been a change of identity, so who you saw yourself um, before and after surgery, so with without a limp and with a limp, it changes a sense of 
who you are and, and and then perhaps also how other people see you and how you see yourself. And the same seems to happen when you've, you've had your, your son um, and your, your shape change, but you're also changing role, aren't you? And you become a mm. nun, so your identity. So there's a lot that goes on. And I think we, uh, in in life, I think we have all these changes and we, we forget to check in with ourselves to, to acknowledge the impact that it's having. Because I think we don't consciously update our own sort of sense of self through that process. Nice. So if you, if you were to, you know, think of those periods where you've lost confidence. Can you think about what your strategies were to get your confidence back? What what works for you? So so generally what works for me now is putting on makeup, doing my hair, wearing clothes that actually make me feel good. So um just I've stopped wearing black unless I can, you know, unless I really have to, I don't wear black anymore because I find that over the particularly over I think probably the last five or six years I've felt Black to me seems quite funereal, um, so so that's that's something that doesn't make me feel good. But yeah, actually making an effort and being able to look in the mirror and think, yeah, you know, you look all right, and you know, you might be big, but hey, you're looking good, even though you are big. Who cares? You know, it's that kind of thing. So so yeah, really, actually making an effort um, to me is always always a good thing that helps me yeah. feel better. So um, I'm smiling. So before we came on live, we did remember to say we we're going to let you know that Lisa's dog's Pauline is next to her. And if you can hear some snoring, that was it. However, I did forget that my husband's just put the washing machine on. So if that is spinning in anybody's here <laughs> and you start hearing, these are the joys of running recording studios from home during COVID and lockdown. Um, I just want that anyone that's getting slightly distracted thinking, what on earth that noise? I just want you to know we have a snoring dog and now we have a washing machine that's just about to take off. So I don't know. <laughs> whether you lot can hear that um, but if you want to just put your mind at rest so you can stay present with here and Lisa and I now that would be fantastic <laughs> so because I know that I was like trying to ignore it but I think it's actually going to lift off the floor in a minute by the shaking that I can hear <laughs> um, I just realized that mine's on as well and mine's just about to go into spin mode so well, we're just we, you and I, Lisa, have been so attuned, haven't we, in on so many levels, on so many things. It does not surprise me that we're on full spin at the same time. <laughs> so, <laughs> on that note, we'll pull it together just slightly right now. So, one of the things is to to get dressed. But what I'm thinking of and what I'm hearing there is there's something about the effort. But there's also something about that looking in the mirror and giving yourself some feedback that you look good and you actually feel good. So. Tell us a little bit about your journey because I know that you are you love colour and one of the things that stands out from you whenever I meet you you know you're the bright colours and you've actually inspired me to get back to my bright colours and actually embrace them which has been so exciting so you might notice on the other episodes I have some quite colourful scarves on when I'm wearing my other detective outfits that are not in my actual bright colours um, <laughs> because I was feeling a bit disconnected for my uh, my true self because the identity of the detective is the essence of who I am but the only detective outfits out there are quite boring and dull and muted what well, you've got a posh word for that haven't you it's tones and shades or something Tints, tones and shades yeah. it's, all technical. <laughs> so, it's all technical stuff it is technical stuff so tell us a little bit about your journey with color because I think it's very easy for um the one thing that really stands out when I've listened to your story is the skill set and the, the abilities you've got that you are so much more than a, just an image and style consultant. Your own personal journey is obviously plays a part in that. But there's also this fascination with colour from really early on. So tell us a little bit about how you got into colour and why that matters so much to you. OK, so so right from, you know, being being a kid, colouring, colouring, colouring in, painting was, was always my thing. Makeup, I loved creating with makeup as well. So. I originally wanted, my ambition was always to become a makeup artist for TV and theatre and to be doing all the special effects stuff and everything. But because of my dodgy hip that I've also already mentioned, I started to do my training for makeup, doing the cosmetic training bit and realised that standing wasn't going to be, you know, standing for long periods of time to work probably wasn't going to be a good thing for me. So I veered off into, um, I was studying art A-levels at the time as well, and I started studying textiles and fashion design, went into that as a, did my degree, got a job working in a design studio once I'd graduated, and that design studio, the guy who ran the design studio was actually part of the British Colour Council. 
and the Collar Council at that time, I mean, I'm going back to like the late 80s now, so, you know, it's, it's a long time ago. I don't even know whether it's still like this. But they were kind of like, like you know, there's like Pantone colour of the year and that kind of thing. It was kind of like, these are the colours that are going to be in fashion in two years' time. And that's what we were doing. And also we worked, we did a lot of stuff for all the different high street brands and they used to commission us to do designs. So Marks and Spencer, they'd go off to Italy, they'd come back with a beautiful silk Italian, you know, Italian silk dressing gown and it'd have like 24 colours then, but every time, every colour costs money. So Marks and Spencers would say, we want this, something that looks like this, but in six colours. And that's what we'd have to do. But it was like these particular six colours and they'd give you like Pantone reference almost. And we had to sit with paint and a paintbrush in the studio window, mixing these colours by eye and they had to be really accurate. So none of this put an eyedropper on a colour and da -da, it's done. It was literally some days it could take all day to mix a colour. So that was my sort of grounding really in, in being able to look at colours and accurately know how they were made up. And around the same time was when colour analysis became a big thing, having your colours done. And um, and my mum being being my mum was like, oh, I'm going to get my colours done. And I was, I was so fascinated by it, really, really could see the difference it made once she was wearing these colours and she'd got these, that swatch she used to carry around in a handbag and everything. But it was very expensive. Um, and at that time, it probably would have taken me like a month's wages or something. You know, I was on like a really low pay, but to, to get it done. And there was this woman who did it in, in Nottingham. I thought I, I never could afford to have it done, but I read all the books and, and did everything. And then there was one time a few, few years later, I was working doing some lecturing. So I became a lecturer after I'd done this design work in the studio. So I was lecturing in, in art and design, textile design for ages. But I was doing this lecturing in the community and my brief was um, to, to with these women to help them boost their confidence, funnily enough. And it was kind of like I could do whatever I wanted as long as it was linked to confidence building. So we did some stuff around colour with them about because <laughs> and um, the easiest way for me to go and get lots of different pieces of fabric that were the same size that we could do for, like pretend colour analysis was to go to Dunelm and get loads of flannels so I went along and got one of each colour and we did like this colour analysis then so it, it's 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 always always fascinated me and then about seven or eight years ago I got a little bit of a windfall um, I'd had some trauma at work I wasn't keen on going back to where I was working and I thought you know what I'm going to set myself up in business so I invested my windfall money in actually doing the formal training myself mm. so that I could do it for a living and help other people. But it makes such a difference when you're wearing colours that suit yeah. you. It just can make you look... But I, 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 th I think listening to you and because I haven't worked with you, I, you said about not being able to afford it. One of the things I know you're really passionate about is, is um, empowering women. And, and one of the ways that you do that is through the... Um, the colours but it's also the quality of the feedback you give people because you really are not telling people what they should or shouldn't do but if they are looking at it going I don't get what I know it doesn't work because I don't like it but I don't understand why your quality or feedback is you help make sense of because they intuitively somehow they know but they can't they don't know why it's not working hmm. and I think that's what I've loved watching you and being part of your program is actually having this it's not imposed on you but you're actually teaching people how to pay attention to what they already their sense that they mm. don't like it um because you've also got the thing about proportion haven't you about where you yeah. put things and so i think we've often we know what does and doesn't work for us but we don't listen to that mm. or we know it doesn't work but we don't know why and therefore yeah. we can't change it and and because like, i think that's where what, what makes you magical is the fact that you yeah. you can look at it and when someone's going, it's not working, but I don't know why, you can go, it's like you still get something, but you're going to have to get in touch with this lady to find out what the hell I'm talking about. But you get this <laughs> us to do this thing where we take the photograph of ourselves and then put it in black and white. I've got a couple to put in the group later. And I'm looking at it going, I know Lisa's going to be able to tell straight away, but I'm looking at it like, I just don't see it. And I think that's what's unique about you is that you've got the training, but you've always, you've obviously got an eye for colour as well and not everybody is gifted with the same gifts are they in terms of, I think, of those things 
Yeah, like my, my sister doesn't see colours like I do. The, the thing is, if we want to get technical, that we've got rods and cones in our eyes and we don't all see colour in the same way. Um, and it's a scientific fact that men don't see as many colours as women do. The, the sort of the, Like we were talking about before, the tints, tones and shades, men don't see that, that range in generally in the same way that women do. Um, so, so people do see colour differently. So I, I, I can see colour quite accurately. But what you're talking about with the contrast and everything, it's that, to me, it's really, really important in my role that I teach you the techniques so that you are then empowered to make those decisions yourself and you're not having to check in. So, and that comes from years and years of me working in education, um, you know, and the whole... I won't tell you, no, that's wrong. If you're saying it's right, unless you say to me, Lisa, is this right or not? You know, and then I'll give you a direct answer. But I like to help you work out why yourself. Yeah. And, and I will coach you and guide you and sort of ask the questions. And, you know, at the end of the day, with all of this stuff, though, my, you know my mantra, it's like, if you love it, who cares? Because it's about, it's that, and that comes back to the confidence thing. Yeah. So there's all these rules and, and I'm doing rules like that yeah, in yeah. inverted commas. That as a as a stylist, as an image consultant, as a colour consultant, whatever you want to call me, there are lots of rules that I can say. Well, you know, if you, you know, if you've got big boobs, wear a wrap dress and, and all that kind of stuff. But at the end of the day, you know, you for you, for example, Cheryl. So so if you said, well, I really love this black dress, I want to wear it because it makes me feel good. I'd be like, yeah, fill your boots. But that's when the, that's where the thing comes, isn't it? That if the purpose for getting dressed and the purpose for learning about colour and the purpose is to dress with confidence, mm. if you love it and you look in the mirror and you love it, then then it'll be okay. Um, and my question is, if you're questioning it, who are you questioning it for? Is it because somebody else has told you you shouldn't wear black? Is it somebody else has told you that someone of your age shouldn't wear a skirt that shirt short? Or you know, because there are rules, aren't they, that we've either been imposed or we've gathered them along the lines and gone through. And I, I call think it baggage. Yeah, absolutely, it is baggage. That's another way of looking at it. But I think also there's, I think. What I love about what you're doing is that you're helping people question it and then question like almost where the rule comes from and is it serving them. But then there is the technical stuff in terms of, like you said, if when we do our proportions of our bodies, that I had no idea, by the way, that my legs were short in relation to my body. I because and I've, I've kind of had we've had this laugh in our house because my husband and I are both five foot five. And my husband is five foot five and my son is six foot one or six foot two. But my husband and my uh, son both have the same inside leg. Right. It does. It does my head in because I'm like, th there's this much difference in their height. But I'm like, and of course Liam's got a really tall body, but his mm. legs are exactly the same shape as size as my husband's. And it was only when we did your course that I got the the fact that you we talk about you know, um, or what did you, is it perspective or what did you call it? it it's illusions, isn't it? The, yeah. Well, tell me a bit more about that because it well, the, the whole thing. So. If you're taking a photograph, it's called foreshortening because if you tilt the camera, you can get the angles completely different. You can make yourself look like you've got very, very short legs if you tilt the camera wrong, which is what my husband always does. When I say, take a picture of me, and then he takes it, and then my head looks like, my head and my head are really long, and then my legs are like this. He's um, so lovely. <laughs> I've taught him, I've taught him now, because I, I actually took a picture of him and said, look, this is what you're doing, and I took him how he was taking one of me and then how I wanted him to take one to show him the difference he was like oh yeah I get it now so um but yeah so this foreshortening but yeah what we're talking about is is about the, the thing is with dressing and with the the rules and things you can literally change where the focus is of your body your proportions on how you dress Mm. So it's kind of like if you've got short legs in proportion, you know, and you've got a long torso, short legs, but you, you know, the idea, what people like that visually aesthetically pleasing is to have longer legs and a shorter body and to be, you know, taught like a model, you know, it's kind of like that's a, it, 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 that's more aesthetically pleasing to us as humans, that, that, those proportions. So it's kind of like to create that there are lots of little tri tips and tricks that you can do so things like what i call wearing a column of color where you wear the same color top and the same color bottoms 
but then put something different on the outside and that makes you look slimmer because you're focusing just on that bit down the middle and th there's so many sort of things you can do to disguise your body shape camouflage the bits you don't like enhance the bits you do like so that they're the kind of rules if you like that that, that we like to talk about but they're never to be sort of oh you should do this because no. because to me it, yeah and, and this is what irritates me a lot about people in my industry I hear it a lot and they say sort of imposing things not all of us do that and some do and and it's kind of like oh well you know if you've you know you've got bingo wings so you should and it's like well she might not have thought there were even were bingo wings until you said anything love you know it's kind of yeah so yeah. it's very much to me and I won't give anybody feedback you'll have noticed in our group I will you know, say is this all right or in what way what do you mean I, I want very specific questions from you guys so yeah. that I will give you the right answers because you know I might think well you know you part of your outfit that you're really chuffed with and I might think but if you don't if you're not questioning that you're really pleased with it who am I to make any judgment you know so it's yeah. very much about the individual and what is right for you not about you know or because you're over 40 you should do this and you know over 50 shouldn't have long hair or you know yeah, all that yeah. but I, I think it's coming back to that thing isn't it about the aesthetically pleasing to as humans because i i often wonder you know because i the brain is hardwired to look for patterns it's looking for symmetry it's trying to work out how it works so you know we, we the one of the hardest things about being a human being is that your brain is doing that and then when someone comes along and they don't fit our expectation of course we're drawn to the the thing that's not how we expect it to be and, and that's mm. you know don't, we don't want to be biased or prejudiced or stereotyped but our brains are hardwired aren't they to, we, we've we've got a ruling or a conditioning that we're expecting yeah. it to be this and so and there's, when there's it's a not whole load there, of, there's a whole load of theory around the, the golden rule the, the fabinacci rule and it's all like in art where there's this like spiral and photographs for composition and all of that kind of thing and it's kind of you know if you want to know about all that I can tell you all that as well but it's like people don't really want to know in that level of detail what they want to know is like you know what if you want to look if you want to look taller Cheryl roll your sleeves up a little bit to three quarter sleeves because that then makes your legs appear longer well you know that's the, that's the my... thing that I've learned from you I, I uh, what's interesting is learning something you, I have to have my colors on 30 years ago I have done some one day workshops but I think what happens and what I love about the way that you work as you do it over time with people mm. is I learned ages ago that a three quarter length is better for me um and because it, it basically one because it stops at my narrowest point on my body instead of a, if I have a long sleeve it stops at my widest point so it's all that thing about where it draws the attention mm. but ultimately when I'm flipping cold I'll have a long sleeve top on thank you very much because I want to <laughs> keep warm so it's it is that you know I I just think it's interesting how the brain is hard way to look for that and then I think when we understand that we'll go oh that might be why we end up in this industry with models because people are trying to fit what the brain has been and so the more we can see models that don't fit that, the more we break that mold of expectation. Because the human, I always have to, you only have to go to the beach, don't you? And look around and realize that none of us look like that really. And when you have that acceptance <laughs> that there isn't, that, that that is not the norm, that is a few people in a few photographs. And I think the more we can expose ourselves to different shapes and sizes of people we i think there's more acceptance of self Absolutely. but what i love about you is you you're either teaching people to go if you love it have it if your subconscious mind is going it doesn't work but i don't know why you can show people where the the, the where the top stops or the sleeve stop or the trousers stop. Between, why mm. why it's having that kind of something doesn't feel feel right and it's just so empowering to watch you in in action and see the, and see the changes in the women not to mention for me, I just love being in a group of girls talking about clothes. <laughs> I I don't think, I you talk about when a youngster at eight or nine, I don't think, um, I had a school uniform. My we, we had Sunday best kind of attitude, so we would buy an outfit for a special occasion. Otherwise, it was my mum made clothes or it's very practical and we were sort of outdoor people. So I never really dressed up apart from like once or twice a year. Mm. And I think I spent all my money on going skiing that I actually realised I've got through life without actually knowing 
what I like. Mm. And so I'm absolutely loving being on the course and just seeing what other people are learning. And sort of, I know, for example, I do not like lace. I really do know that I don't like that. But it, it's really, the feel of fabric is, I've realised, plays a big part. And, that, and, and this is the thing, and it's kind of, for me, it's really important that people understand why they like something and why they don't like something, because then that will stop you buying things that end up in your wardrobe that don't ever get worn because it's that that 80 20 principle it's kind of like we wear 20 percent of our clothes 80 percent of the time it's like let's switch that around and if you know that well that doesn't work for me even though i really like the look of it when i wear it the proportion is not right or the fabric's yeah. not right or you know i know i'm not actually going to wear it. we say this with my so my stepdaughter's 10 and um she, she she doesn't live with us all of the time but we we used to always have some clothes in and, and she, she she's been growing so quickly so it's like every few months we'd be taking her out to get clothes and we'd buy her like a whole load of clothes to keep at our house and then it'd be like oh yeah i really like it and then she's and then we realized that she wasn't wearing them and we're like well so now we say right so do you like it and but will you wear it and she'll go oh, i like it but i don't think i'll wear it so we like we don't buy stuff and you know girly stuff anymore because she no. she liked it but she didn't she didn't want to wear it you know she's yeah. the, and, and it's uh, really interesting that question isn't it because I one of the things I have found the most challenging over the years is going shopping with people because they if I say I thought if I said I liked it 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 meant I had to try it on and I had to um, but I've learned to go oh I like that for you because <laughs> yeah. I'm just like it's really lovely. But no, I don't want to do it. And I found those whole conversations, that's a whole other video we could do, a whole other interview about conversations about clothes. Because I think when people are trying to help you, they're often projecting what they would yeah, want, what, what they, they want. Like. Mm. Um, and then it's like, if you're not very good at, you know, don't like upsetting people like I used to be, I'm a bit more assertive now and just say thank you very much, but no thank you. Um, but you've got about to have those conversations. So just to wrap up then, if you were to give people, um, I know I'm putting you on the spot with this now, three tips or a couple of tips of how to dress with confidence, what would they be, Lisa, just to sort of wrap us up um, today? I think, I think my, my first one, if you're wanting to choose colours that are going to suit you, the simplest way, and it, and it works for everybody, is to wear colours that match your eyes. So look really closely in your eyes. Most of us have got lots of little flecks of all kinds of different colours. And if you pick any one of those colours and wear it on your top half, it will make your eyes pop. Your eyes will look brighter and your skin will look clearer. Um, and that's an easy fix for anybody to try. Um, another one would be just to, you know, if you really like something and you love it, think about why you like it, why you love it. Is it the shape? Is it the fabric? Is it... And if they do it in more than one colour, buy it in all the colours. If you really, really, really love it, buy two so that when that one's worn out, you've still got one. Um, I'm a great, you know, I've got pairs of shoes. I've had the same shoes for the last 15 years. There's a particular pair of shoes that I absolutely love. And I'm on my about my 10th pair of them. Once they wear, I just buy another pair. And I've also got them in three colours because I love them so much. And I know that they go with everything. So it's kind of, that's okay to do that. Yeah. So, you know, have a kind of work out what your thing is, have your uniform and also buy things that only buy something. If it will go with three other things in your wardrobe, that's another tip, because then you're mixing and matching and you're yeah. not ending up with orphan yeah. items. Yeah, lovely. So the first one is to check the colour of your eyes, which obviously sounds you may need like need a friend if you're not very good looking in the mirror. So get someone else to perhaps consult you as well on your eye colour. Look at what you already love and pay attention to that and keep a record so you can work out what your 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 um I think you have it what you call it your formula, don't you? The things that work yeah. for you. And the last thing is only buy if it goes with two other things. So you've got three. go to two or three things. So three things. So it's not an orphan item that stands in your wardrobe, not knowing what to do. What okay. a great way to finish today's show. Thank you so much for joining us. We will be putting the links below because I, um, you can do the Savvy Style online because I know it's really important to you, Lisa, isn't it, that people get access to this stuff who can't afford maybe one-to-one -one coaching with you. So there's an online program, which I've just completed. And I have to say it was absolutely fabulous because you are a teacher you you are so clear in the way that you communicate through your online oh, videos there's so much brilliant. information in there to actually it's, it's easy uh, uh, easy to learn from it in that kind of environment but you've also got online membership group coaching programs and you can do one-to-one -one work with people so yeah. we will be putting all the links below yeah and and 
it, even if you on the group coaching program or the one-to-one -one, you still get access to the um to the study stuff as, as well the same so fabulous fabulous so if you want to find out more and want to get in touch with lisa please contact her below with the details we're going to leave for you thank you very much thank for joining you. us this week bye lisa thank you.